this is Sandy Peterson and we're going to talk about the Chaos Empire in the Gods War. So first we're going to talk about their special ability and weakness. Now their unique ability is called Festering. It happens during the power phase and what occurs is that Chaos gets one extra power for each Chaos Nest that shares an area with another faction's building. <clears throat> we'll get into how it does that in a minute. The second ability, the weakness rather, is called Loathsome. And this means that they can never be the first player, even if they have the most power. So if they have the most power, then the first but the second most player becomes first player instead. And they also never benefit from the Glorantha boost. So that extra plus one power that you get when the Chaos Rift isn't around, they don't get. They just have to survive without it. So let's talk about the buildings. They have one type of building, which has two different forms it can take. It's called the Chaos Nest. They get six of them, so they have fewer buildings than the other factions. Um, they only cost one point to place, but their special ability is you can place them in the same area with another faction's building. They can only have one Chaos Nest in an area, but because you get one extra power for placing it with the building, typically Chaos is trying to place all his nests with other factions' buildings. The other factions don't like this, and sometimes they may do things about it, sometimes they may not, and they just kind of deal with it. But that's a, uh, a feature of chaos, always buddying up to their players. Uh, since they only have one type of building, they only get two power for building types in the power phase. But since they get the extra bonus per building, that kind of makes up for it. And actually, typically in the early game, they have uh, a solid amount of power, so they aren't lagging behind. Um, the unit types. Uh, unlike most factions, they have uh, no lesser gods and no hero. They have six of their minions, which are the brews, which like other minions, cost one and have a combat of one. Uh, they have three greater gods to make up for their lack of other units. And these greater gods are, first, there is the Lady of Disease, Malia. Now she costs two and she has a combat of zero. There's no requirements to place her except the typical one you have to have a building to place her at, in her case, a Chaos Nest. And her ability is that anyone who declares combat in her area, including Chaos, by the way, loses, a, has to spend a victory point. This means if you place her the first turn, typically no one can declare combat in her area because no one has any victory points. The idea is that she's a lady disease, then everyone in it is busy coughing up a lung or feeling to, uh, you know, rumblies and their tumblies, and they don't want to fight, okay, so it makes it bad. Now, she's very useful to Chaos any, despite this, not only because she dampened combat, but you, later on when you get blood sacrifice, that's kind of her purpose is to go around and benefit off that. Her second greater god is the Magna Mater, Thed. Now, Thed costs four power to summon, as much as a, like, a regular greater god. And to summon her, you must have the Lady of Disease present on the map. So that's her requirement. Somewhere is Lady Disease, then you get you get the Magna Mater. Her combat is 1d6. That mean, doesn't mean a combat of 1, it means you roll a d6 and you see, oh, I got a 4. That means she's going to roll 4 combat this combat phase. So, so she's kind of unreliable in a sense. You don't know if she's going to roll 1 die or 6 die or something in between, but it's usually fairly decent. So she could be really good in combat or she could be as bad as a minion. You just don't know with her. Her special ability is called Eruption, and it's a new action that costs two power. Eruption lets you remove one of your Chaos Nests and replace it with all the brew minions you have in your pool. So, for example, if they're all there, you place them all on the spot, and then you have a huge army all at once. Uh, if, if you have no brews in your pool, because you already erupted somewhere else, if you use Eruption, you still remove the Chaos Nest, but you get zero brews. Uh, you may ask why would you do that? Well, normally you wouldn't, but you might because sometimes you want to remove a Chaos Nest because it's in a place that's not useful to you, so you can place it somewhere else. Um, the third uh, Chaos Greater God is the Mad God, Ragnaglar. Now, he costs six, so he's one of the most expensive units in the entire game. In fact, I think he might be the expensive, most expensive. And his combat is unusual. At the start of the game, if you're playing Chaos, you put the Mad God marker on the zero box on the victory track. Every time a unit is killed, either in battle or because of a gift, not a rune, but a gift, then or, or an ability, then you move the Mad God marker up one. doesn't matter who kills it. If Storm fights Earth and each of them lose a couple guys, you move the Mad God Mad God marker up accordingly. 
and uh, this is the Mad God's combat. So the more combat there is, the more death there is, the higher it goes. So he likes it when other players are fighting. Of course, you can fight and raise it to yourself, but uh, that's the Mad God's combat. Now, his ability is called Torment, and during the power phase, if the Mad God's on the map, and he has at least 10 uh, combat, which is pretty typical by the time you get him on the map, you roll a d6, lower his combat by that much, and he spits out a rune for you. So you get you can use him to get one rune per turn during the power phase if his combat's high enough. So if, if you use him and his combat sinks below 10, then during the turn, usually Chaos is trying to get it back up to 10 so they can get another rune the next turn, because runes are cool. Okay, now we're going to move on and talk about Chaos's hero quests that he, to, that he has to do to get his gifts. I don't know if I should call Chaos a he or a she. Usually I do it by the uh, what the gender of the main god is, but Chaos has three. One's male, two are female, but the highest one is male, so I'll maybe I'll call Chaos an it. So Chaos, um, obviously this is not, these are not in order because you can get them whatever, whatever order works out, but one of them is the Spike Shatters. When this happens, you take the Catastrophe Rune and you put it in that slot and you also, not the Catastrophe Rune, the Catastrophe Gift, and you also get a rune. Okay? Next, summon the Lady of Disease, Malia. This gives you a gift. So, usually they get that the first turn, but not always, depending on what they want to do. Um, when you summon the Magna Mater, also a greater god, you get a gift for that. And when you summon the Mad God, He's worth a gift. So three of your gifts come from summoning your gods, and they're all in different fragments. So if you do nothing but summon the gods, you'll have three power for the three fragments, which is kind of useful. Um, her other, her other uh, gifts um, can sometimes depend on other players or they can produce them for you. One is a battle occurs in which there's two kills. They don't have to be on the same side. If there's a battle between two players and each of them gets a person killed, that counts. And at that point, you get that gift. And it's it's exciting. So you're kind of looking around at the early game for that kind of battle to happen. And it doesn't really take too long. I generally, it's in the late second, early third turn when that takes place. And the one that that's the hardest for him to get is when the Mad God marker reaches 10. There's been 10 deaths. This will eventually occur, but it can take a while. And sometimes you have to prod the other players with your own units to get it. I've seen a game where the Chaos player sent... Um, a giant army of brews into a huge enemy fort, knowing a bunch of his guys would get killed exclusively so that he would uh, be able to get his Mad Guard marker up. And he didn't care when they died because he could just erupt and make more, so he was heedlessly careless of the lives of his men, like a good Chaos Empire should be. Okay, let's talk about his gifts. Well, I already mentioned the Catastrophe gift, which is the one that you get when... Uh, the spike shatters. Basically all this does is it's the gift that gives you permission to be in charge of the chaos rift and uh, also gives you a rune each time you start the chaos rift struggle. Now just to avoid confusion, when you first get this gift because the spike shatters, then you get a rune. Then later on in the council phase, which is actually usually when it shattered, you do the chaos rift struggle and at that point chaos will get a second rune that council phase. In future council phases it'll just be one rune each time because he already got the uh, the catastrophe thing, but that's where it goes. When the chaos rift is finally closed, you flip that gift face down so you don't have to worry about it anymore and you can go on to other things. Okay, other gifts. They have the gift of embed. This is an action that costs two, and you take one of your chaos nefts and you flip it over to the embedded side. Every chaos nest has two sides, the regular and the embedded. Now, an embedded chaos nest is still a chaos nest, but it has uh, some new features. First, it produces one power all on its own. That means that if it's all by itself somewhere on the map, it produces one power a turn. But if it is sharing a place with another player's building, it'll produce two power, because every chaos nest produces one power for being for sharing a space, and then because it's embedded, it produces another power. So it's actually not hard to, to, to add up chaos as power. Basically, you, what you do is at the start of the turn, you say, okay, I get two power because I have one kind of building, I get one power per fragment, I get one power for each chaos nest in an area with someone else, that's three or four, whatever it is, and then I get one power for each embedded nest, and that's say two or three, and then that's your total power. Um, the other two things that an embedded chaos nest can do is that when an embedded chaos nest is destroyed, instead of being destroyed, it just flips back over to the regular side. So it's actually pretty hard. It takes two attacks to get rid of it, which is obnoxious. The only way it can be destroyed without, um, uh, in one shot is if Storm uses his um, insurgency ability to replace the nest with a temple. 
because that just replaces it and it doesn't get a chance to, to become a chaos nest. So a storm actually has a slight edge against chaos because of that ability. Um, the other thing that a chaos nest can do is when you attack an, sorry, an embedded chaos nest, when you attack an embedded chaos nest, it produces a kill in the attacking army unless the enemy army has a greater god or there's a ziggurat in the area. So you can shield yourself against the kill produced by an embedded nest, but sometimes you don't care and you, like it'll hit by a barbarian anyway, so no big deal. Okay, Chaos has the gift of the Unholy Trio. This is a one-use gift, and it happens at the end of any battle phase. So what you do is you take this gift, and you flip it face down, and you don't have to be in the battle. Anyone can be in the battle. Face down, and all of the routes rolled in that battle become kills. You also get a rune when you do that. This flips that th that card face down. You only do it once in the whole game, but it turns a bunch of routes into kills, and in a big battle on both sides, there's always a risk that Chaos is going to use the uh, uh, the Unholy Trio and make a ton, ton of kills. Another good reason to do that is to bump the Mad God marker way up, which is cool. Plus, you get a rune, so it's cool. Okay, one of the early gifts they often take... Yes? Oh. One of the early gifts they often take is, I fought, we won. This happens during the council phase. And this is a way of chaos getting extra power or at least hurting the other players. And what happens is that all the players get ready and they get their fist like this. And then chaos counts one, two, three, and then everyone else either extends a finger or shows a brave fist. And the idea is if you do the fist, you're standing boldly against chaos and you lose a power. But if you go like this, it means you are kind of caving into chaos, and chaos gets a power, up to a maximum of three. So if two of the players go like, if you're in a five-player game, two players do this, two players do this, the two players that did this each lose a power, and the two players that do this lose no power, but chaos gets a power for each of them. So I thought we want is uh, kind of win-win for chaos. Either the other players are losing power, or he's gaining power. No matter what, it's a, it's a pleasant experience. Okay, so now we will discuss their Blood Sacrifice Gift. This happens during the Council Phase. Each area that shares an area, sorry, each empire that shares an... Okay, let's go back. The next gift I want to talk about is Blood Sacrifice. Blood Sacrifice happens during the Council Phase. You look at each area that contains a Chaos Greater God. Remember, you have up to three of these guys. And in each area that contains a Greater God, you pick an enemy empire who's in the area with you. And one of their units or buildings in the area is destroyed. They can pick which one, but it's destroyed. If you have the Oblivion ability, which we'll talk about later on, that applies to this kill. Um, so, so one of the purposes, so this is like natural, like, custom made for the Lady of Disease. She can just go sit around on somewhere, no one ever attacks her because it costs a VP, and then she like blood sacrifices stuff every turn. And uh, one of the things that I've seen people do, you take, you, if you see uh, uh, the Lady of Disease coming into your area where your temple is or something, then like, I better make a unit there so it'll, when it blood sacrifices, it'll kill the archer instead of the temple because who wants to lose a temple? And it's an awkward thing. Um, the final ability is Oblivion. And this is a pretty scary ability. What happens is if a unit is killed by chaos in battle or by blood sacrifice, then one of the units that was killed um, gets, like the owner gets to pick. Either this unit or building is destroyed forever. And I can never rebuild or summon it again. Or chaos gets a rune. It's up to you. Now, this ability is so mighty that Chaos can only do it once per enemy um, fact, enemy empire per full action phase. So once you, you do it, you take an Oblivion marker and put it in a little box on your thing saying, I have done Oblivion to Darkness. Then for the rest of that turn, you can't Oblivion Darkness anymore. Until the next power phase, when you remove your Oblivion markers and you're ready to start doing it again. So a properly played Chaos trying to maximize Oblivion is going to want to attack all the other players every turn and be earning runes or killing units. This is also an ability you don't want to wait too long on because if you save until the end of the game, the player players may say, well, I don't mind losing the guy forever now because it's near the end, I'm probably not going to resummon him, so you don't get your rune. But if you do it early, no one wants to have a shrine or a, or a unit gone er that early in the game because they might need it. So then you get your runes and then you can use that to bump yourself up. So that is the explanation of the details of Chaos. Now, the way Chaos seems to function in-game is it is sort of like 
not pointless destruction, but like chaotic destruction. You build your army, you send your troops going around, you're trying to suck up guys with blood sacrifice, you're spreading out your chaos gods to share the love. You have this army of brews that you don't care about getting killed. You actually usually have a fairly solid amount of power from your uh, um, from your chaos nests. And, you're, and it's pretty quick to get your fragments, so you have power from those. And you are a truly terrifying force. One of the features of chaos is you have to keep on the move and attacking, because you only have six buildings. And other players have up to ten, so you kind of have to make sure that keeps being maintained. Fortunately, your buildings are pretty cheap to do. Now, one of the things people wonder about is if they should embed or not. Now, embedding costs two power, and so you don't really get, and even though it gives you a power when you embed it, you don't really get paid back for the cost of embedding for two entire turns. So you don't really do it for the power, though it does help mitigate the cost. You do it to make a chaos nest hard to destroy. And it's a, it's a pretty big pain to destroy an embedded chaos nest. No one wants to have to attack your stupid building twice. Plus, attacking it even once is, is sort of a pain because they can't conquer it. Like, when you, if I'm a storm and I attack a darkness shrine, I get to push my own shrine. You know, it's great. But I attack a chaos nest, all I get out of it is like, whoop to do I killed chaos. And then I'm looking at the other players and they're saying, hey, you're a sucker, you attack chaos, so we didn't have to. So there's always that uh, thing too. So chaos is this uh, nasty thing that only takes and, and, uh, and has, is a lot of fun to play. Also, of course, chaos really profits from the chaos rift. I mean, that's when they're in their prime. So uh, it's always fun every turn when you get to rule the chaos rift and watch everyone else whine and complain and wiggle on the hook. So chaos is really fun. Um, I think you will like trying them out. And that is the chaos. Empire.